Hey, hey, everybody. It is so good to be back on the podcast. We've got a special treat for you today. We are talking with Lenora, and she's going to help us with her last name. <laughs> it's Aders. Nobody pronounces it right, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to be full disclosure. That's what you get on this podcast. Uh-huh. The yeah. one thing I wanted to ask you in our pre-chat was, how do I not botch your last name? And then I didn't do that. <laughs> so, we have started building a culture of botching last names. That could really just bad. be our thing. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. Lenora is a powerhouse. She has had an incredible career and she is just getting started. Honestly, Um, she has done some amazing things with the American Cancer Society, and we are looking forward to diving into all things good. But our story really connects to Julie. So I want to give her a chance to say, hey, our producer. Hey, resident so I hype girl. am a huge fan of Lenora. So she serves as a board member of the sorority that I'm a part of. And so I've admired her from afar. I'm like beaming at the her picture on our screen right now. <laughs> but I met her a few years ago when I was still in college at one of our conferences that I was attending. And I told them about how awesome she was, how high up she has made it in American Cancer Society and her heart and just her goodness as a human being in general. And I was like, I don't think she's going to remember me, you guys, but like, I'm happy to like reach out to her. Um, And of course, like she remembered and I fangirled and um, I'm just so excited to introduce her to our community. um, I remember the celebration emojis when you landed. I'm sure it was probably like gifs and memes. So excited when Lenora said yes. She's amazing. (laughs) Julie's just like humbly saying that all because really she was a star as a collegiate member and continues to be in Trade Alta. She won Aww. awards. She is phenomenal. So when she emailed me, she's like, don't know if you remember me. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, of course I remember everything you did when you were in our collegiate chapter. So yeah, what's going on? So it's really the one we should be fanning over. So uh, thanks for having me. We will always thanks jump so on much. a Julie, a, a good Juju love fest because oh. we love our hope girl. <laughs> well, now I'm blushing, but Lenora is amazing and she has a lot of wisdom to share. So I'm excited for this conversation. So great. So, I mean, Lenora, please tell us a little bit about yourself. We know you've been, you've served in some really incredible roles. Please connect the dots for us and tell us kind of how you ended up and what you're headed to right now. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, went to the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, which I'll come full circle back to Ohio at the end, but graduated from there, served as a consultant for uh, Julie and I Delta, and got a chance to travel for a year our collegiate chapters, our alumni members, and really help them develop as leaders and individuals on campus. From that experience, I realized I wanted to get out of Ohio and see more and do more, and I wanted to stay in higher education. So I joined Golden Key, which is an international honor society in Atlanta, got to work in um, higher education as well as nonprofit in in that world. And I ended there as a director of programs, which was a really cool role because I basically got to take all the benefits and bring that to life for our members. So scholarship programs, meetings and events, networking opportunities. And from that, I realized how amazing nonprofits are and how they change the lives of those that they serve. And so I wanted to continue to do that work. And so I joined the American Cancer Society about five years ago, headquartered in Atlanta, have served in a variety of roles in our field uh, in the Southeast area, served most recently on our global headquarters team, driving national strategy for our golf and gala products and really our top constituents. And actually as of a week ago, accepted a new role that I'm super excited about that will get me back to Ohio and my family and some of my friends. And I will be um, taking on the role of an executive director. So I will be over Ohio, West Virginia and Northern Kentucky our income teams, our events, our corporate partnerships, our cancer control relationships, and really driving impact and change through our mission work there. So I'm super excited to get back to OHIO and uh, to continue to make an impact with ACS. I I mean, that was so much. So much. I mean, and what, what Lenora is not saying is, she is happily married. They have the most darling 10 month old daughter <laughs> and she's got four rescue animals at home and what, and she trains for triathlon. Like, so do when you do, do you things? sleep, Lenora? That's a pre baby. I should, the last one I did was pre baby. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's giving you amnesty for that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Little sleep. But, you know, I think uh, that thank you for saying all that. My wife's probably like, wow, thanks. I'm last again. Um, but, no, no, happily married. Know. Stephanie, we recognize <laughs> you. We honor you. 
Um, but yes, I have a, a really full life and all of those, those people and those animals bring me joy and happiness. And so um, really couldn't do everything I do in my world without that, that circle of love and support from dogs and cats to, to humans. <laughs> Well, I think everybody in this in, in the nonprofit world has clearly heard about the American Cancer Society. And so I wonder if you could just give us like kind of an overview of the organization as it exists today and dispel any myths. And, and I'm really curious about how broad your scope is, because there are so many chapters. I know John and I were, have a dear friend that used to work at the American Cancer Society, and it's such a great organization. So give our listeners just a little bit of background. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously a lot has changed in COVID, but I, we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. But the American Cancer Society has been around for over 100 years. Wow. And the really amazing thing about ACS is that we serve people and fund research across all cancer types. So well, there's a few different areas that ACS really focuses on that the donor dollars go to work to really creating a world free from the pain and suffering of cancer. And the first of that is research. I mean, that's the cornerstone of really us winning the fight and leading the way to make cancer a thing of the past. But we have 49 Nobel laureates and each year we give about a hundred million dollars in research to over 200 institutions nationwide. Wow. So wow. that's a really big deal for us. And again, how we're gonna ultimately win that fight. But in addition to our research program, we have education, advocacy, and what I call our patient services. So we try to serve people as they're on their cancer journey and then continue the fight from um, really the, the bench side to the bedside so that we can continue to find a, and fund a cure. So on that service side, we have Hope Lodges, which most people don't know about. Those are our home away from home across the country. Mm. Cancer patients can stay free of charge in COVID those were actually transitioned to house healthcare workers so that they could get Brilliant. The time and sleep that they needed while they were serving those that were, you know, most critically ill in our communities. And then another point of pride for me is our NCIC call center, which is actually in Austin, Texas. It's um, there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the entire year long, no holidays are off, they are there. But we actually started a new video feature in COVID so people can call in all times of the day and night. We have nurses, doctors, psychologists on staff there and people can get answers to questions that they have. You know, whether that's support from a, that a caregiver needs while they, you know, don't want to break down in front of a loved one or a cancer patient that needs to know about clinical trial options for them. So um, really, like I said, I think the extraordinary thing about ACS is that we're funding things as people are going through their journey. We're trying to be proactive in the fight through research, and it's across all cancer types. So really a special organization in my unbiased opinion. <laughs> We're with you. We, awesome. And we are biased and we, we think it's wonderful. And I love the stories of how you're able to innovate and pivot in COVID because I think at the onset of the pandemic, all of us in the nonprofit world, we were in that like just paralysis of yeah. what do we go? What do we do? Do we ask? Is it inappropriate to ask? Do we still keep the mission forefront? I mean, we work in, we worked in healthcare and you, certainly yeah. you too. And it's, and it's like, you just don't know what to say. And then as we move past that phase of uh, paralysis, then we're in analysis paralysis where it's like, now right. what do I do? What's everybody doing that works? And I just really love just the innovative nature of how you guys continue to serve and, and meet your people where they are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, COVID to your point, it's given us a unique opportunity to pivot and, and it's now more important than ever for us to continue to really talk about the work of ACS because we are looking at a $200 million budget shortfall because of the financial crisis and wow. pandemic. So it is something that we are continually um, talking about and trying to figure out ways to connect our story with individuals in our community and donors to continue our mission moving forward. Awesome. Well, yeah. could you help us like just set a baseline for ACS? I know y'all have got a huge footprint in the event space. And I know I want to yeah. talk a little bit about how events pivot in light of COVID and other things. But just set a baseline for your team. Lenore is going to be too, you know, um, humble to say this, but she saw crazy growth with her team there. They saw double digit growth year after year. And so I just love for you to just speak of like what was kind of the status quo. And then I want to come back and let's talk about what's the new status quo. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I have always been involved in distinguished events, which for us means our gala and golf events really are opportunities to engage high net worth individuals and introduce them to ACS. But in addition to those events, we have our signature, which a lot of people know property, which is Relay for Life. Sure. We also have Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, which is every October funding breast cancer research and prevention. We have endurance events, so runs, bike-a-thons, mountain climbing, everything else that happens across the country and world. We have youth events and more. So our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising space is robust and has traditionally been a leading income source for ACS. So we love traditional in-person experiences. We love the opportunity to connect with folks face-to-face, -to, -face, to tell our mission story, to produce best-in-class events, and to really engage people in our work moving forward. So COVID really threw us a curveball when we thought, oh my gosh, at the time, right? Maybe we won't have in-person events for a few weeks, then we thought a few months. And as we've continued to try to perfect and pivot our digital engagement and experience, it's really been a, a change from our traditional face-to-face -face fundraising events, which has always kind of been our bread and butter. I love that too. And I just, I, we've talked to a lot of people who, um, like you mentioned, I mean, the, the budget shortfalls are just such something that we're all facing and, and you feel so strapped because you, the, the, the human connection piece is best served when we are what you said in that in-person face-to-face space. And so, um, yeah, I wonder if you could talk about maybe something really innovative that you guys have done, um, to kind of pivot away, um, from those traditional yeah. events to maybe, um, and maybe you've had some great success from even pivoting. You've reached people that you haven't been able to reach in the past. Yeah, totally. So I think in this whole COVID thing, the thing that I continue to say to myself and others is like, we have the chance to flip the script. So rather than us saying, oh, we're so sad, we can't hold these events, just like what you said, what is our new opportunity to re reach constituents that we've never been able to talk to before? Oh, we have one night where we get everybody together. Well, now we have multiple communication channels leading up to the digital event. So let's flip the script in our head and think about this as an opportunity moving forward rather than an obstacle. So really our peer-to-peer -peer events, um, we really think about three things when we're thinking about converting those to a digital space. So first is our quality content. So always leading with our mission and the work of ACS. I think it's more important now than ever, like we talked about in a pandemic, to make people understand why their donation matters. And what we've seen so far from cancer patients is over 80% of cancer patients have had their care disrupted because of COVID. So people, right, are, are at times afraid to go to the hospital or don't have access right. or don't have insurance anymore. And so leading with the mission and the why helps us to produce that content and that heart-filling moment that we've always had as part of our events. The second is the production value. So making sure how do we transform a best-in-class in-person experience to the digital space. And that's really through our number three thing, which is creating that authentic human connection. So how do we create interaction and engagement virtually? So We've had a lot of um, social media wall feeds featured at events. We've had different contests at our Chicago Discovery Ball. They partnered with Salesforce and they had best dress contests throughout the events where people could take selfies. They even did a best dress dog contest. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're going to need dogs. one of those. Dogs were trending. <laughs> We're going to need one of those photos to so put fun. in the show notes page. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's how do we produce that online event that's going to keep our audience engaged from start to finish. And I think we all thought again, just a few weeks ago, all right, let's get through 2020. Let's do the best we can do in this virtual space. And 2021 is going to be a new day. And as we continue to reflect on that, we now are getting a lot of feedback from um, our constituent base saying, we don't know that even Q1 and Q2 next year that we want to be at our traditional, you know, our making strides events can have 30,000 people, right? So our traditional events. So we're continuing to think about ways to pivot because now people, right, have gotten like Zoom fatigue. So we could have the best <laughs> digital event. People are like, I cannot stare at the computer for one more minute. So we have some events pivoting to drive-in or drive-through styles using old school like drive-in movie theaters with really beautiful meals brought in a safe way to their cars. Oh my gosh, I love we have that. folks mm -hmm. doing very small gatherings, so less than 10 where they're bringing in a chef and 
will actually bring in a video feed and they'll drop into that person's house and you'll get to at least hop around to some different host parties during a virtual event. So we're continuing to think of new ways to really push those boundaries and those borders while creating engagement and community through our events. So we're excited, but we gotta, we have to keep thinking differently and keep innovating and keep pushing ourselves to think outside of that traditional fundraising box to make it happen. I love that you, you know, you've camped out on these three kind of values, so to speak of your yeah. events. And I love that you're just retranslating those. You're not saying we're, we're avoiding our values. We're just going to forgo the authentic connection for the next foreseeable future. It's like, how do you weather that? And I love that y'all are pivoting and coming up with unique ways. Um, I would love for you to go into some, some of those examples and kind of talk about how you did it, specifically that house party. I think that is so innovative. So what did that look like? You've got people, you're bringing in a chef, it's just their family. And then you're streaming in a video. So they, um, some of our guests want to host watch parties. And so they will invite some of their friends that they feel comfortable with, depending on where it's happening in the country, but parties of 10 or less, we'll send them a video kit um, as part of our production company. They'll set up their video kit. Um, we have some great local chef partners, floral partners, some actual musical trios that have all donated their services to come in in a safe way and create these really small, intimate, beautiful spaces where people, again, can can feel that connection. And then we stream in the event like on their TV screen. So um, then during the event, we hop around from host site to host site so people can check in. And this host site is eating menu A and the chef talks a little bit about what they prepared. Then host site B talks about what cocktail they prepared. Maybe host site three has some great wine and steak pairings. So again, just trying to find ways to connect people with each other and allow them that time together to celebrate the work of ACS, but continue to raise the money we need to raise. There's so much I want to say about this, <laughs> and I can't because you are the guest. But it, I mean, really, if you are, are tuning in, there was just 17 examples of creative ways that you can adapt your message and, and adapt to what your constituents need. And the thing that I love about it from a marketing standpoint is you have all of this fresh content that is completely fueled by your base. This is not something you're pushing out and it's so raw and authentically pure that, I mean, you're going to have content you could use forever, shareable content. <laughs> and the thing is, it's just, it just is a testament to how passionate people are about your mission, that they want to find ways to connect and they want to get in the spaces, you know, that, you know, not everybody is a formal gown gala kind of wear, but it's like, you know, I could put on a formal gown in my study with my house shoes and still make it work, you know, <laughs> while my kids are running in and the dogs barking. I mean, that's real life. And I mean, that is what our missions are about. So I just, I just think that is such a brilliant move. So bravo to ACS for just all this ingenuity. I'm really curious about um, just philanthropy in action at ACS. And um, there is no one on this planet that does not know someone that has not been affected by cancer. And it, it is such a global uh, and health issue um, that is so much bigger than us that I, I would think that it would, it would allow people to relate to your mission really, really well. So I'm curious about maybe a story or a time that you saw philanthropy come full circle, um, whether you were in the middle of it or kind of looking at it from the outside in. Yeah, I think um, that is the beautiful and heartbreaking thing, like you said about our mission, right, is that everyone has been touched by cancer. And so we want to create a world where that is not happening anymore. And so I had been one of those lucky and weird people that had always been like one step removed, right? Like a great aunt when she was in her 80s got cancer or a third cousin, you know, different things like that. But I had never directly felt cancer um, since joining the American Cancer Society. Well, about a year and a half ago, my parents actually came down to Atlanta for the weekend and they were driving back to Cincinnati. They were about two hours outside of Cincinnati and my dad felt this extreme pain in his arm as he was just driving down the road. And my, he screamed out, my mom's like, what's the matter? He said, I think my arm just broke. She was like, are you crazy? You're sitting there. There's no way your arm just broke. And he's like, no, I feel like my arm broke. 
And because my dad is stubborn, that's where I get it from. He drove the rest of the two hours still to Cincinnati. They pull into the hospital parking lot, get out, go to the emergency room, gets x-rays. And the physician comes in and says, sure enough, you broke your arm. And they're like, how, what, how is that even possible? And he said, you have multiple myeloma. It's a blood cancer. It attacks your bone. And it's so far along, it's so aggressive that it's already attacked your entire arm. And so you need to be like the bubble boy. We need to wrap you in bubble wrap and send you home because at any time from the waist up, all of your bones are in that critical space and could break. And so we're going to get you into the doctor right away. We're going to get this handled, but you have cancer. So my parents, I was on a trip at the time for Tri Delta in DC, and like any good parents, they didn't tell me until I got home because they didn't want to upset or worry me. So I yelled at Classic. them for a long time afterwards. But um, seeing his battle firsthand has really brought to light the struggle that not only our cancer patients but caregivers go through every single day. And it's actually a connection back to ACS that continues to fuel me each and every day in our work. So ACS has, like I said earlier, a long history in the research space. And we've always funded young investigators. So these people that haven't had um, you know, national funding yet, but they have really great bold ideas. So I'm gonna take you back to 1963. We had a researcher that applied for a research grant at the time. His name was E. Donnell Thomas. And he wanted to conduct research on something that was called a bone marrow transplant. Mm. And anecdotally, I've heard at the time when our peer review process got this, they thought this sounds absolutely crazy, but like at the same time, we have no reason to think that this couldn't or shouldn't work. So for over a decade, we funded him to conduct research and clinical trials that led to the first successful bone marrow transplant in humans. He went on in 1990 and won the Nobel Prize and obviously had tons of funding after that. But if it wasn't for ACS and that initial funding, who knows if we would have the bone marrow transplant today. So back to my dad's story, he ended up getting a stem cell transplant, which is part of a bone marrow transplant, as part of his protocol in multiple myeloma. So it was truly through knowing what we had done to fund E. Donnell Thomas, which then decades later helped my dad, which then allowed him to be here when my daughter was born, his first grandchild, and has kept him here still today. So it is a total full circle oh, moment for so me cool. working for the organization that you could say funded the research that saved my dad's life. So um, definitely a beautiful gift to see in action. I mean, that that to me is the pinnacle of philanthropy because yeah. when you go into service, you you are working on behalf of the nameless, faceless people that you will never see. However, every once in a while, the face becomes so close to you that it again, I mean, it is it is such a moment where you know you're in the exact right space. And how's your dad doing today? He's good. He's, um, he's still on a chemo protocol because multiple myeloma is a cancer that never really goes away because it's in your blood. So he's on a new protocol, which the FDA continues to approve. We've seen great progress with multiple myeloma over the past decade. So he's handling it well. He was down here this weekend. We were annoying each other because we're both <laughs> strong-willed and bullheaded. So he's doing well. He's back to his normal self and, you know, really taking his role of grandpa seriously now. So, um, you know, I just, I feel so fortunate that my story is in that place because to your point, you hear stories all the time with different endings, but that's why we continue to do the work that we do. Beautiful. I love it. And what a meaningful and impactful career that you've already gotten to have. And like I said earlier, it's like you're just getting started on on making yeah. even such a bigger difference. I'd love for you to speak directly to so many of our listeners are new to the nonprofit world and they are going to hear your story and be like, how do I become like Lenora? What is some just actionable guidance of where do you start? Let's say you get a first opportunity or a job. How do you lean in? How do you become, you know, so irreplaceable as you've, you know, obviously I just raised my hand. How do I become Lenora? <laughs> <laughs> Julie, Julie just leaned is in that a at, a, at a crazy <laughs> Nobody level. can see yes. it, but I just raised my be hand. Be like Lenora, hashtag. <laughs> you know, I think for me, it's, it's twofold. I, um, I'm an extremely hard worker. Every opportunity I get to show up 
and show up big, I do and try to do 10 times over. So whether that's I have a new supervisor and I want to do a great job of impressing him or her, I have a big volunteer committee meeting, you know, I took every opportunity to show up big and do that really, really well. So I think that hard work, there's nothing that beats hard work, consistency, and showing up. And then couple that with finding your passion. So I, I still say, you know, like everybody would say, this is what I want to do in 10 years. I still have no clue what I want to do in 10 years, but I'm <laughs> so happy right now that I feel like continuing to find and make decisions based on where my passions are will continue to lead me to the next right move. So it's figuring out like what makes you get out of bed in the morning. Uh, my cousin recently told me she was going to apply for a new job and it was selling toothpaste for major company. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a terrible job. <laughs> well, that's how I said, but like, what a terrible job selling toothpaste every day. Like for me, that just wouldn't make my heart sing. And for me to be really successful and energized by the work that I do, I have got to love what I do. And it's hard and not every day are you in that, you know, 110% all in mode. But for me, it's been that hard work fueled by that passion that's continued to give me opportunities to grow in my career and um, continue to work for a cause and an organization that I love. I love that so much. And there are those of us who are just hardwired to need that in our job. I mean, I, I joke with my husband all the time. He's a family law attorney. You know, you make the living, I make the difference. Um, <laughs> and he's a great sport about it. Um, but it's like, you know, I, I need to go to work and it, it, just as he does, you know, to, to do what he can to help alleviate something, but I need something bigger. And I love that you have said that. And, you know, the beauty of you having this small child is that you kind of live that out loud. And it just sets this beautiful example to her, not only of um, the hard work and the tenacity, which by the way, if you are as obstinate as you say you are, that's going to help you a lot because I know <laughs> I am the same way. <laughs> I'm too very stubborn. Um, so I just think that's really a lovely way to say it. And it's such a good segue to this question that we always ask all of our guests, which is, what is your one good thing? You know, we ask for advice for anyone that's listening right now, whether they be someone that's in the nonprofit space, a young professional, or just somebody who's logging on to just learn about the great work of ACS or, or hear a story of hope. What is, what is some advice you would give to someone who's looking to move the needle today um, in goodness, success, having a good habit, something like that? Yeah, I think... You know, I think we've all had an extra minute to reflect on this kind of thought and concept over the past few months uh, amidst COVID. And so for me, I've continued to think about what are the things that fuel my heart and passion? So like working out makes me feel good. I try to make time for that daily because I feel better after that. You know, being with my daughter makes me smile and cry and pushes me in all areas of my life. And so I want more of that. I recently discovered being a new mom that I really like to drive by myself in the car with really loud music <laughs> and sing like that makes me feel free and and happy and just really like alleviates all of my stress and worries and then working in the nonprofit space gives me that larger purpose. It gives me meaning. It makes me realize the impact that we can have on another person's life. So I think for me, you know, continuing to figure out and get to know myself and the things that fuel me and make me excited makes me a better wife and mom and colleague and community member because I feel better about myself each and every day. So I would just say, you know, continue to find those things that make your heart tick and that make you want to jump out of bed in the morning and just put a smile on your face. Okay, I need to have a follow-up question to that because everyone <laughs> needs a visual. <laughs> If you could only have one album or one singer oh. in the car with the windows rolled up. And she has mm -hmm. to sing it now. Because I am a show. spontaneous uh, singer of songs, Outburst, and um, I don't always get the lyrics right, but I would love to <laughs> visualize who you are singing at the top of your lungs when you're getting all that nervous and creative energy out. Yeah, so um, this, you know, I don't know if it's a surprise or not, but mine would have to be Pitbull 
Like there's something about Mr. 305 that just makes me feel like he's singing. It's dancing. He's got a good beat. Like it's energy. Yes. I went to a pickle concert in Atlanta. It was an outdoor venue and it rained the entire time. And <laughs> Steph and I were just like dancing and it was just like so what awesome fun. Experience. And so I would have to, I would go with, with pickle. That was like the best Double. answer. I mean, can you not visually see that? I am seeing muddy dancing humans yeah. like living their best life. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. I also have no rhythm and always forget music lyrics as well. Oh, so like we're don't look at me in the car, but like in the car I'm in my own world, so it's fine. And shower. Shower amnesty for singing as well. So if you're in your car, turn off the podcast, turn on some Pitbull. And After just you're done cruise. with this. <laughs> there you go. Right. Well, Nora, it has you're been amazing to get to chat with you. You are a light and we appreciate all that you are bringing to our industry and just the encouragement you brought us today. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you um, One last thing work. is how can people connect with you? Almost forgot. We want to point yeah. people your way. What's the best way to reach out or to get connected with ACS? Yes, we would love, love, love any volunteers and folks that want to engage with us in this critical time. So I'm on LinkedIn, Lenora Eaters. Um, last name is O-E-T-E-R-S. So send me a message and we will get connected and we'll get you finding your passion and doing good work in your community and across the world. So thank you guys for what you're doing. This has been a really exciting uh, time together. Well, you have an infectious personality, and I think we're all just kind of drawn into your aura. So thank you for coming into our community and giving so much great counsel and um, just so much inspiration today. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys.